thank you. So yes, as, as Johan said, I'm from the Center for Biological Control at Rhodes University, and I focus my research on aquatic weeds. Most of my research is on water hyacinth because it is the world's worst water weed, and it takes up so much of our time. It, it costs governments millions, um, and so we really need to, to have a, a an integrated approach to managing this plant if we're going to if we're going to win the war against it. So I just like to go back um, for those of you who are not familiar with bio, with with invasions and invasion biology. So in um, 1987, sorry, I just want to get I've got a, a bar here. I'm just going to make that disappear. Um, in 1987, a, an ecologist called Peter Kareva said, if we are to deal with nature as it is, as opposed to some idealized view of pristine nature, we had better strive to understand the ecology of invading organisms. So that was about uh, 30, 30 odd years ago. And we really have come some way since then in understanding the, the um, impacts of invasive species, which is largely why we want to control them and their ecology, um, which, in, which allows us to understand how to control them. Why is this not moving? Okay. And to go back even further, invasion biology as a science um, really started in the 1950s when a very famous ecologist, Charles Elton, published a book called The Ecology of Invasions by Animals and Plants. And that was in 1958. And what he said is they, as in biological invasions, are really happening much more commonly. Indeed, they are so frequent nowadays in every continent and island and even in the oceans that we need to understand what is causing them and try to arrive at some general viewpoint about the whole business. And absolutely, this is exactly what um, where we are now. Um, you know, this is nearly, oh, now I have to think of my maths, um, uh, 60 years later, 70 years later, and we really do, we have come so far in understanding um, biological invasions and, and how to manage some of them, but definitely not all of them. And in 1982, following some of this research that had happened, um, three, three key questions uh, were posed. And this was by SCOPE, which was the Scientific Committee on Problems of the Environment, which they wanted to know is why are some species invaders and others not? You know, why, why does the rose in your back garden not invade, but um, rose hip invades Lesotho? Why are some ecosystems prone to invasions? You know, why are our South African grasslands so prone to invasions? Why is the fainball so prone to invasions? But things like deserts, which is probably obvious, are not. And how should management of ecosystems be developed in light of answers to the, the above? And in 1988, after SCOPE launched GISP, which is still active, called the Global Invasive Species Program, they stated that invasive species are now recognized as one of the leading global threats to native biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. And this is almost um, tied with, with um, climate change. And in fact, the two of them probably go hand in hand. And so we sit with, with species like this. This is water hyacinth. Um, some of you might have close experience with it. Some of you may have never seen it, but it certainly is the world's worst um, aquatic weed. It's invaded every continent except Antarctica, and it invades pretty much from 35 degrees south to 35 degrees north. So that whole um, more... Uh, uh, more temperate, temperate areas through to your subtropical and, and tropical areas. And this is just a picture on, on Lake Victoria in Kenya, where you can see people whose livelihoods depend on, on the system for transport, um, for food, are severely impacted. Lake Tana in Ethiopia, this is quite a recent invasion. Um, the system is, com that, that is water hyacinth as far as the eye can see. And I'm sure most of you know how water stressed Ethiopia is. So having an invasion like this on a system like, like, Lake, like Lake Tana is absolutely um, detrimental to the country. And I think this one is just, um, it's just one of the most insane pictures. So again, this is the Buriganja River in, in Bangladesh. Water hyacinth from one end of the system to the other end of the system. and People would have 
relied on boats to get from one side of the river to the other side, you know, for, for um, meeting with families, for probably tra travel and transport. And here, these boat transport people have lined up a number of these small boats and people literally have to walk across the boats to get from one side of the river to the other. So how exactly did we end up in such a, a bad position with this plant taking over waterways? And the story goes that in 1884, in December, the World Industrial and Cotton Centennial uh, Exposition, or the World's Fair, was opened in New Orleans. And this was a fair that attracted people from all over, all over the world to come and see the new um, technology that had been developed for, for the cotton industry, which, which was um, huge at that time, um, obviously a very controversial industry given its, given, um, its equivalence with the slave trade. And at this time, the story goes, there was a, a Japanese delegate who brought with him water hyacinth plants, and he handed them out to the attendees as a farewell present basically saying, look how beautiful this plant is, take it back to your gardens, put it in your aquaria, put it in your ponds, and you'll have this absolutely beautiful plant that comes from South America. And that's obviously why it was spread. It's a, it's a beautiful plant. It's got these um, spikes of flowers with really pretty lilac, um, with lilac flowers on them. And so it was deemed rather attractive and Soon it was sent all around the world. This is the 19th of March, 15 years later in the USA. So now this is in Florida, which is quite, quite far from um, Louisiana. And this is a newspaper article in Harper's Weekly showing how water hyacinth has had overgrown the St. John's River in Florida. And then you can see one of those typical um, steamboats trying to get up the river and the artist's impression is this, this complete um, cover from one end to the other of this plant. So that was um, just before the turn of the century. And South Africa wasn't immune. The first reports are that water hyacinth was, was first um, noticed on the, the systems in the Cape Flats in the Western Cape. And in 1910, it was recognized on the Vol River in um, the Free State Province. And this is a picture from, I think I took it in 2008 or nine, where this is 10 kilometers of solid water hyacinth from one end of the Val River, from one side, one bank to, to the other bank. And so we're, as I said, not immune, which is obviously why we work on this. And this is the distribution of water hyacinth in South Africa. So I'm fo obviously focusing on South Africa today, but Every country in sub-Saharan Africa has water hyacinth in it, except for Botswana. Um, but I was on the Limpopo um, River the other day, and water hyacinth is on the Limpopo River as well. So it's on an international border with Botswana. So can we say that um, Botswana is immune from this? So really a huge problem in our, in our eastern parts of the country, the subtropical parts. Um, the Western Cape, the, the Mediterranean um, climates of our country, and even on these high felt um, areas that receive cold, you know, really cold winters, the plant does well there as well. So if we have to look at this, this, you know, this is Tongard River, it's um, KZN, um, just north of Durban. And from one end, again, one end of the river to the other end of the river, um, at, at this time it was taken over by water hyacinth. So why do we have these mats when in its native range, um, in the Pantanal in Brazil um, and the Amazon basin, we get these, a couple of plants um, intermixed with other plants such as this um, Victorian, this giant water lily, um, the, uh, Regina, uh, what's it, Victoria Regina, Regina Victoria can't think of that right now, um, and other aquatic plants where they, they, they coexist um, with each other. One is not taking over from the other. And if we're going to try and understand this, we really have to look at what makes an aquatic um, or any ecosystem for that matter function. 
And I'm sure there's a lot of ecologists in the room. Um, for those that, that, that aren't ecologists, we'll quickly go over this top-down versus bottom-up regulation of, um, of, of food pyramids. And so if we're looking at bottom up, we're literally talking, I just want to get my um, pointer. Okay, We're talking about bottom up, so driving it from what's in the bottom, what nutrients are available in that sediment to the primary producers, which are, if we're in a terrestrial ecosystem, it's obviously our plants, our, our grasses and trees and shrubs. And if we're in an aquatic ecosystem, it's some of these large leafed plants, but also a lot of phytoplankton. So these little tiny plant um, planktons. And the amount of nutrients in the system is what determines how abundant or how productive that system is in terms of primary producers. The next level then is, is of course the herbivores and they rely on the primary producers for nutrition. We then have um, carnivores that feed on the herbivores and we obviously have higher um, higher level carnivores that feed on the primary carnivores which feed on the bottom carnivores. So this bottom up all depends on what nutrients are available in the system. Whereas if we had to look at top down drivers, this is where our, our carnivores and herbivores are driving what happens to the level below them. So if we have a huge amount of, of carnivory going on at this level and this level, we then reduce the amount of um, in, um, herbivores that we have, which could then increase the amount of primary producers. So it really is these two things working together. We can't say that one, one system works um, alone. And to put this into more of a, um, a stylized diagram, we can have a look at it as at the bottom, we've got limiting resources. We must always remember that nutrients in ecosystems um, are, are limited and that determines our pool of primary producers. So if we're going bottom up, we're saying that resources that limit net primary productivity determine the energy flow through that system. And those limiting new, um, resources are water, nutrients, light, space, and there, there's, there's quite a few of these limiting nutrients. And so the amount of primary producers will affect the amount of herbivores, which will affect the amount of primary carnivores. And as we go on, and then, as I said, if we go top down, this is where energy flow is governed by top predators, which influences the level below. Now, what we are facing in not only South Africa, throughout Africa, throughout the world, is that suddenly we have got abundant resources. So our, our resources are no longer limiting. And in this case, in these aquatic systems, we're talking about nitrogen and phosphorus. And nitrogen and phosphorus are largely due to um, anthropogenic inputs from humans. And so because we've got all these nitrates and phosphates in the water, no longer abundant. And so we have a huge amount of primary producers. And if we have a look at what's going on um, in these water hyacinth systems, they are getting, they are dominating and taking over because our aquatic systems are becoming more and more polluted with nitrates and phosphates, which largely come from fertilizers, um, from agriculture, from industry, um, and from human, human waste, so from sewage. And in South Africa, we have, for some unknown reason, um, taken a different approach to adopting what is, a, is acceptable. So the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development is an international organization. And they, they stated what is acceptable levels of phosphorus in an ecosystem. So phosphorus is a key component of phosphate, and that is one of the most limiting nutrients for, for plant growth. So trophic here means production or, or level, and oligo meaning a little, meso meaning medium, and eutrophic meaning u meaning high, and hyper obviously meaning over the top. So the world OECD said that no aquatic water body should have phosphorus in it that is greater than 0 0.1 milligrams per liter. And 
1996, or 86, now I can't remember, 96, South African water quality guidelines um, adopted um, a much higher phosphorus standard. So our standard is 0 0.25, which is more than double what the world, um, this, the, this international organization said should be acceptable in, in wastewater. And so we really are looking at more than double the amount that is allowed in water. But what we're actually dealing with, and I'm sure most of you know this, is way more than 0 0.25 milligrams of phosphorus per litre. And why is why do we have such high levels of, of phosphate and phosphorus in our, in our water? We've got very poor water quality due to inadequate treatment of sewage. If you follow the news at the moment, um, we, there are cholera outbreaks um, all in, in at least four parts of the country. There's sewage flooding people's homes. Um, the Val Triangle is sitting on a sewage hotbed. We've got lack of waterborne sewage in informal settlements where waterborne sewage runs straight into the rivers without being treated at all. We have um, non-point inflow of agricultural runoff. So literally running off our agricultural lands downhill into, into streams, into water bodies below. And all those, um, first of all, the fertilizers that have been used to cultivate the, our crops, um, run off and also the animal waste. So think about all that, um, all the feces and all the urine that's coming from cattle farming, sheep farming, pig farming, probably not sheep farming, but definitely pig farming and um, chicken farming. That's also flowing um, straight down into a lot of our systems. And what's really scary, and this is a 2016 ex, um, estimate, is that to fix South Africa's water-related infrastructure is going to cost at least 570 billion rand over the next decade. So I think where we are with ESCOM, I think where we are with, with water-related infrastructure, and we really are looking at a financial and socioeconomic disaster um, that if we can't find this type of money, and we know that this type of money rarely gets allocated to the, to the right place. And if you follow Anthony Turton, who's um, he's he's a retired um, uh, ecologist or sci aquatic scientist from the CSIR, he's been very outspoken about how poor our water quality is. And this was a News 24 headline a couple, uh, probably a year or two ago, saying a tsunami of human waste inundates our rivers and dams. And there you can see a a um, a, a manhole just pouring sewage out into this wetland. And what happens then? With all those nutrients um, entering the system, we end up with pea green soup. So this is where phytoplankton would have, would have bloomed. This is um, cyanobacteria, a blue-green algae that um, is quite toxic, very dangerous to human health. And this is Harder Beersport Dam. Um, a couple of years ago, probably about 2012, I took this picture uh, where the blue-green algae was just across the entire dam. And um, the Crocodile River West, so this is, um, where's West? Oh, coming out of Hadebeersport Dam. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is, this is the river going downstream that's feeding all our agricultural areas from Brits through to Tabazimbi all the way to the Botswana border, just completely polluted with, um, with, with nitrates from upstream and blue, bursting with cyanobacteria. And of course, Rhoda Plot Dam, excuse me, I just need to drink some water. Rhoda Plot Dam is to the east of Pretoria, showing this mixture of blue-green algae and water hyacinth as a consequence of um, upstream sewage works that are completely dysfunctional and pumping raw sewage into the dam at a rate of knots. If any of you um, have, have children, please don't let them do rowing. Rudaplat Dam is South Africa's premier rowing um, spot, and I would never let a child of mine into that water. <laughs> and here we can see a typical um, industrial site. This is Mbazamba Swamp. It's um, in the background, you can see the town of Stanger. Again, this is just north of Durban. 
And here is a paper mill, a sappy paper mill. And this paper mill pumps its effluent from manufacturing straight into the swamp, which should actually be a pristine wetland, and water hyacinth has taken over. And just to show you what these plants can, how tall they can get, the more nutrients you get. This, this is actually my husband, uh, Martin Hill, whom I work with. Um, he's not that short, he's not that tall either, but you can see how tall these water hyacinth plants are. This is, this is taken in um, just outside Cape Town on the N1. And this is my colleague Grant Martin when he was a student with me. And this is in Worcester, no, Wolseley in the um, Western Cape. And pulling those, and he is very tall. So those plants are enormous. So if you have nutrients, you are going to get an abundance of, of um, green stuff growing, whether it's algae, whether it's plants, and what is that doing to the ecosystem? So water hyacinth, we know, reduces benthic macroinvertebrate diversity. We've done a couple of studies um, across South Africa. Studies have been done throughout the world showing the negative impact that water hyacinth has on, on our aquatic biodiversity. And yeah, we, this, in this case, we're talking about these little hojos that um, live um, in, the, in the benthos, which is that layer just above the, the sediment. Um, they're very important players in, our, in ecosystems. And um, if we have a mat of water hyacinth covering, these little things disappear, and that's because their, their regular food disappears, oxygen disappears, uh, that whole system becomes completely anoxic um, because there's no more photosynthesis in the system and um, huge knock-on environmental impacts. This is another picture I took from um, Makati Sprite, which, which leads into um, Engelhart Dam, which is on the Lataba River in Kruger Park. And yeah, you can see, you know, we, we talk about these little hojos, but there's also big hojos that are very impacted by the presence of water hyacinth. So what, how do we deal with this? You know, we know that we've got these abundant resources. And the first thing any of you should be thinking is, well, let's stop the abundant resources entering our system. And once we've done that, we, we're more than halfway to controlling um, these, these problem plants. But unfortunately, that is a lot um, harder. Um, what's it? Easier said than done. So how can we, um, what can we do? So we know that we've got top-down drivers. So if we increase the pressure from our top-down um predators or herbivores, can we then reduce this primary, um, this pool of primary producers? And that's essentially what uh, biological control relies on. So what is biological control? Well, I'm sure you know that most invasive species are species that are introduced from elsewhere in the world. They're not native to the, the country that they're introduced from. And um, they arrive in this country free from natural enemies. And they, they can be intentionally introduced, as is the case of water hyacinth, or often there are accidental introductions. We call those hitchhikers. Um, and in order for these plants, or, or not only plants, any pests to arrive, um, well, not in order for it, but what we, what we aim to do, especially if it's intentionally introduced, is to introduce this pest free from its natural enemy. So what controls it? naturally in its in its indigenous range and that would be those natural enemies that would be those um, regulators those top-down regulators so what we do as biocontrol practitioners is go to the center of origin so water hyacinth comes from the amazon basin from the pantanal and um, as biocontrol scientists we go back to that center of origin and we look at what is feeding on the plant in that center of origin because and this is quite a mind-blowing fact. Every single plant in the world is associated with at least one insect that can only feed on it. And we call that insect a host-specific insect. So what we do is go and look for insects that are potentially host-specific, and then we bring them back to the country where the, where the, um, the species is a pest, and we test to ensure that this potential biocontrol agent is completely safe. 
And this can take anything from two to 10 years, depending on the insect, depending on the plant. And um, we really work hard to ensure that this insect is host specific, that it can only feed on the target plant. It cannot feed on agricultural plants. It won't feed on other indigenous plants that are closely related. Um, and so once we've satisfied those requirements and we've satisfied that the, um, the insect is damaging as well, we can then apply for release. And this is, this is typical throughout the world where um, biocontrol scientists will do the work. They, will, they are then satisfied amongst themselves that the insect is, is safe. And sometimes they're pathogens, not just insects. There's also disease causing pathogens such as fungi or bacteria. And um, a petition or, a, or an application is submitted to the relevant um, governing, governing, uh, government body. And in South Africa, we submitted to um, the um, DALRAD, so the Department of Agriculture, Land and Rural um, Development, and we submit them to the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. And they then submit to send these applications on to um, experts who review our application and then will say, yes, we are satisfied or no, we have some concerns. Please carry on with some testing. So that's biocontrol in a nutshell. There we go. If we have a look at water hyacinth biocontrol agents, it's, um, it's been going on for a really, really long time. The first insects in South Africa were released in 1974, and it's um, this little insect, Neocatina hyconia. And it was released following um, applications made in the US and releases in the US, released into South Africa because water hyacinth was, was a problem. Um, but the program kind of fizzled out and was then reignite, reignited in the late 1980s. Just shortly after that, another similar weevil was introduced um, as well into South Africa. Same year, a, a mite was introduced, as well as a fungus, as well as a moth. And all of these species could coexist with each other, they could damage water hyacinth and, and not be, um, there was no, not much competition between them. In 1996, a bug was introduced, this little um, bug called Secretatasis, and in 2010, a grasshopper was introduced. So we have the suite of biocontrol agents against water hyacinth. And in South Africa, we've released more biocontrol agents against water hyacinth than anywhere else in the world. So we can look at all this feeding damage, and um, here you can see this is mite damage, this is weevil damage, and particularly in the stems where the caterpillars and the weevil larvae um, mine, we get a lot of damage. But we still end up with huge um, mats of water hyacinth that are highly damaged, but they're still sitting there. So, so you know, what's, what's going on here? And again, we can look at eutrophication. So it's this increase, um, the, this increased nutrient status of our waters that not only promotes the growth of the plants, but it also limits the success of classical biological control. Furthermore, in South Africa, well, not only in South Africa, but with biological control, and I suppose in, I mean, in this in this case, it is South Africa and water hyacinth. We've introduced these insects from the warm tropics. They've come from the Amazon where temperatures um, are quite warm and they don't fluctuate hugely and they don't go very low. And what we've done is introduced them into areas that are high altitude, cold, get frost in winter, snow last week. Um, and we expect these little insects to be very happy and multiply even though they are physiologically mismatched. So we know that climate mismatch between introduced biological control agents and their inv invasive host plants limits biological control. So how, how can we look at improving this, um, improving this control of tropical weeds in more temperate regions? And I was lucky enough to collaborate with some really top biocontrol scientists um, throughout the world who experienced similar problems. And so this is Delta Park in, in Johannesburg. Johannesburg, as you know, is, is, um, gets very cold winters. We're in the midst of one right now. So in summertime, the, this little um, 
dam in, in Delta Park in the little bird sanctuary was completely covered in water hyacinth. As autumn approaches, the plants start to die back. It's getting too cold. And in the middle of winter, it looks like a, a mat of, of dead leaves. And that's all that it is. They are dead leaves, but the crown of the plant is still alive. And what happens is that in summer, we back to square one. So the plant regenerates from its crown um, and or any insects that would have been released on this plant were either killed in winter by the cold or killed by the fact that there was no food for them. So the plants explode and it takes a really long time then for the insect to catch up. Even though we knew all this, in 2013, we released a new agent. And this was an agent called Megamela scutellaris. And if you follow the water hyacinth program in South Africa, this is the little um, silver bullet or the showstopper. But why did we release it knowing that it was going to face exactly the same issues that all of the other biocontrol agents um, faced? This came from Argentina. Um, from the from the northern parts of Argentina that were a lot more tropical than South Africa, yet we still released it knowing that our waters were eutrophic and that our climate was too cold. And the first place that we released it was on the Kabusi River in the Eastern Cape, and that's because this was the closest site to um, Rhodes University where we work. So we had reared up these little insects, we brought them across in um, in containers, and I was pregnant at the time here, yeah, very committed to my job. And there you can see I've got a, a little cooler, and inside the cooler are these megamelas. So there we go, open them up, and they, they breathe South African or feel South African sunshine on their backs for the first time. But look what happened in winter. So we did exactly what we released these insects knowing that they were going to face the same issues that all of our, our other um, insects had had faced in the past. So what we did was we had a look at their um, thermal physiology. And what that means is we looked at how many generations these insects could complete at various sites around the year, given the temperature of the year. So we do some tests on the insects, and then we can look at um, their thermal physiology. And that area that I just showed you was down here. And we knew before we released them, because this paper came out in 2013. So we had done this study in, in quarantine. We knew that over winter, this insect wouldn't be able to reproduce. It wouldn't be able to produce any generations. And in a whole year, it would be able to produce 2.3 generations. And further north here around Gauteng, so this is where a lot of our um, water hyacinth infestations are. Harder beer sport is, is just over here. Um, Rida plot is, here or here, um, we had a look and in a year it could produce five generations, 3.9 generations, and only half a generation over winter, 0.1 or, or 0.5. So we, we knew that, that this insect would struggle and we released it. So what we had a look at was how did the, how did the plants fluctuate um, over the seasons and how did the insect numbers fluctuate? So this is at the Kabusi River, where we released Megamelis in 2013, and we made a couple of releases, not too many, and what we did was we tracked water hyacinth and the insect populations um, over a year and a half, so from May 2017 to August 2018, and you must remember that winter in, in South Africa is from May to about August, so really, really cold, peaking in um, January, February, and then getting really cold again. And what we saw was that, as we predicted, water hyacinth biomass was pretty low over winter. And as it got warmer, water hyacinth would increase. So as the, the um, temperatures warmed up, the plants regrew from that base, from that crown, to a maximum in, in January, in midsummer. At the same time, we were measuring the insects. and this is insects per meter squared. And here you can see very little. So sometimes we didn't find anything. We didn't find anything in November. We didn't find anything in December. And January, we started to, to see insects. February, they started to pick up. And as they were picking up, water hyacinth was declining. And that's our classic 
predator prey model. If you if you did any biology at school or, or early university, you would have learned about the snowshoe hare and the and the um, what was it the Arctic fox. And this is how their populations fluctuated. So the increase in herbivory resulted in the decrease in, in plant biomass. And as plant biomass decreased, obviously insect numbers were going to decrease because they were running out of food. And what we realized that we need to do is shift this peak of insects to way early in the season. We couldn't expect them to build up by themselves so that by the end of April, we've got the highest numbers, but then we're going straight into winter. So we really needed to look at how could we get massive numbers of um, insects into the field before water hyacinth exploded. And that is where Hardebeer's port comes into the, the, the picture. So this is Gauteng around here. And Harder Beersport Dam is at this little point. It's on the border of the Northwest Province and Gauteng. And our high felt has got an entire series of dams um, along most of our major rivers, and all of these are, are hypertrophic. So we're focusing in particular here on Harder Beersport Dam, but similar situation or similar conditions across this, um, this belt. Just to go there, Paddy, there's Bronco Sprite Dam. Paddy Wall is joining us from the Bronco um, Sprite um, Catchment Management Forum, which is also battling with, with water hyacinth. So we over here at the moment. Johannesburg's down here, Pretoria's over here. And this is Harder Beersport Dam, an old aerial photo taken um, probably in about 2017, where you can see the extent of, of water hyacinth on this western section of the dam. And for those of you that didn't know, Harder Beersport Dam is the second biggest tourist hotspot in, in South Africa. It's been hypertrophic since the 1970s. Water hyacinth was chemically controlled. Um, this was successful in the 80s, but eutrophication was never addressed. And in 2007, um, the Harder Beersport Dam Remediation Program was initiated called the Harties Metsia Mayor Program, and that aimed to use plants to remediate the water quality. Um, by 2015, millions of rands were spent. Um, there was still lots of water hyacinth. There was still a lot of um, algae in the system. And in 2017, the Department of Water and Sanitation pulled the plug on the program. And at this point, there was no, the, all the herbicide application that had taken, um, that, that had occurred throughout from the 1960s, all herbicide application was stopped as well. And what happened was, water hyacinth exploded on the system. And this is, you know, this is what the water looked like. All the available agents had been released in the 1990s. So despite the fact that all these agents were on the system, there was still a lot of water hyacinth. So the CBC was asked to, to get involved in um, 2018. Uh, we were a little bit wary of it because of the political nature of Harder Beersport Dam, because we knew how cold it got, because we knew how eutrophic it was, but we were mandated by um, environmental affairs to get involved. And this is what Harder Beersport Dam looked like. This is a satellite image. It's a sentinel, um, it's a sentinel satellite image. And I have a very um, clever student, he's now graduated, who developed this app. And if anybody wants it, and if anyone wants it for a particular system, um, David can um, sort it out, uh, can, can share it, and he can develop um, a, a tool for, for any particular system. And this allows us to calculate how much water hyacinth is on a system. So this is the 6th of March, um, and remember that no herbicide had been sprayed on the system. And when we went to look at the plants on the 18th of March, this is what they looked like. We knew there were lots of, of biocontrol agents, and in the absence of any spraying, the agent numbers had, had increased, but we still had these masses of water hyacinth. So obviously the agents um, were still limited by cold, they were limited by nutrients. And again, we've got these abundant resources, huge amounts of primary producers and not enough herbivores. And that's termed classical biological control. These things were released in the 90s and that's where it ended. So we decided to adopt a new type of biological control. 
um, and augmented biocontrol, which we call, which we, we term inundative biological control, where we relied on frequent inundative mass releases of megamelis. Um, and we started this in 2019 at Harder Beer's Port. And every two weeks, we sent about 10,000 insects from our um, from our quarantine facility in in Grahamstown. And I don't I don't want to spend too much time because I think I'm already rambling a bit. But this had been done before um, by Martin Hill and Plant Protection and colleagues in the U.S. on Lake Victoria, where mass rearing of the weevils took place by local fishermen around Lake Victoria. That's what Lake Victoria looked like in 1998. And through inundated mass releases <clears throat> of the weevils, a year later, that's what the Kusumu um, Yacht Club looked like. So we even wrote a paper about it, how to control water hyacinth in Africa, but we were still um, a bit slow doing it in South Africa. So at Grahamstown, we've got the Vianac, Vianac Mass Rearing Facility and our Sisonke program, where we employ people with disabilities to mass rear our insects for us. And it's really easy. It's just um, water hyacinth in a tub with some nutrients. We put the insects on. And um, here we've got Landile and Majeke who are um, who rear the insects for us. They collect them in these little vacuums and we package them up in curry tubs and can send them off by courier or by post. We also started um, programs, rearing programs at, at some of the local schools. And this was at Pekinwood um, at Harder Beersport Dam. And then my student, PhD student, Keneal Wesebola would also receive the insects from us and release them at various parts around the dam. So we've been doing that since January 2019. And after um, soon after winter, when we'd expect there to not be so many plants, we were looking at 35% of the dam was covered in water hyacinth. And we'd go and we'd have a look and we could see that Megamelis had established, but clearly it wasn't having this huge impact on the system. But by December 2019, if we have a look at the satellite images, there was 20% of water hyacinth on the dam. And this now is when water hyacinth, if you remember, would be at its peak population level. So we went to investigate in January 2020, and this is what we were faced with. All the brown is water hyacinth, and no, that's not herbicide. This is due to feeding damage of the biocontrol agents. So these agents sap the suck of the plants and cause plant death. In addition, the weevils exploded. Remember, there was no um, herbicide application, so the plants weren't being weren't constantly being killed and along with them the insects and so we had this mass explosion of biocontrol agents and by the 27th of January we were down to five percent of water hyacinth on Harder Beer Sport Dam which was absolutely unbelievable seeing as no herbicide had been sprayed by the 30th of July and I remember this is the middle of lockdown um, there was only 1.7% of water hyacinth on the dam. But then came the, the springtime, and this was October, and even though we have this huge um, dieback over winter, we're suddenly getting an increase. And what was happening here, and I'm sure you can put two and two together, but seeds. Water hyacinth is a prolific seed producer. Um, it can produce more than... Um, Two and a half thousand seeds per meter squared. We did soil cores um, across different sites in South Africa, and yeah, the the, the number of seeds this plant produces is incredible. Given that water hyacinth had been on Harder Beer's port since the 1960s, um, there is probably a huge amount of seeds in that in that um, sediment. And this is a picture of the seedlings: short, fat, bulbous plants that were starting to explode on the dam. And by the 2nd of December 2020, we were back to, or worse than, square one, so 42%. But we had carried on mass rearing. We had carried on releasing. We had set up rearing facilities with um, some of the estates around the dam. Um, and this has probably been, or this is probably one of the most important factors in getting control of water hyacinth now, um, is setting up these small tunnels, which the CBC donated, filling them with in exactly the same way as we did it in Grahamstown and 
the local local communities could rear their own insects and release them. And here, obviously, these are little kids who, who are quite excited by, by insects, and they came along to see what was going on. And we released, um, at the height of our releases, you can see here 90,000 megamelis released in November 2020. And you can see that these releases are largely um, from the beginning of spring through to December, and then the plants disappear, or well, the plants get so um, infected that we don't actually need to release them. So it's spikes and spikes. And the bugs exploded as we, as we expected them to. And this is me looking incredibly happy because we were, we, we were seeing exactly the same thing as we had seen at um, the beginning of 2020. And by the 13th of February, 2021, the plants were down to 17%. The insects were exploding, they were leaving the plants, and this became quite a bone of contention for residents. This is Megamela swarming at light at night, so a beautiful summer evening, and people couldn't go play tennis, um, they couldn't eat at restaurants, and this was only um, about, um, it took, a, it was, a, it occurred for about two weeks, and boy did we have um, a lot of backlash about that. Never mind that water hyacinth disappeared. That's just what, um, the, the mega melis on the tennis courts looked like the morning after. But by the 12th of March, 7%. This is what the coves, that place where the rearing station looked like in, in um, the end of March, and by May, the water was clear. And so we know that by changing our approach from this classical approach, we will release a couple, um, maybe do a couple releases of insects or one large release, by changing it to an augmented biological control program using these inundative and frequent releases, we really can get on top of biological, of water hyacinth biocontrol. And this is just to show you um, the percent water hyacinth covers. It's, it's um, the, the green. So during that classic cycle that we saw at, um, at Kabusi, so water hyacinth increased, and then we counted megamelis um, on the plants. Water hyacinth increased, it started to decrease because megamelis increased. Water hyacinth dropped, megamelis dropped. Nothing over winter. Um, and then again, water hyacinth increased, slowly megamelis increased. And we did have a much smaller gap though in those peaks than we had um, previously. And so what we've managed to do is increase that top-down pressure of herbivores onto our primary producers, even though we have these abundant resources. But what we do know that we have to do is our releases usually start late October, early November. If we want to get on top of water hyacinth, what do we have to do? Oops, wrong way. We have to shift those releases to when water hyacinth starts in August, September. And that is what we are busy trying um, at the moment around Harder Beer Sport Dam, um, at Broncos Break Dam, a couple of other systems where we're setting up these, these mass rearing stations and keeping the insects alive over winter so that we can release them en masse um, as soon as the little seedlings start to germinate. And hopefully then we can reduce these huge peaks in water hyacinth much earlier. So we, we want to reduce the size of the peak and we want to reduce um, uh, the, the occurrence of the peak. And we got a lot of um, press from this. The Melon Garden in South Africa thought Megamelis was amazing. It even got to the Times in the UK. And we know that, as I said earlier, we know water hyacinth biocontrol is limited by eutrophication, this nutrient pollution, by cold winters because of insect mortality, by interference from herbicides, and because of regeneration from seed banks. If we adopt an inundative mass release program in the absence of herbicide operations, we can get control of water hyacinth. And what we need to do is include stakeholders because we cannot do this from, from Grahamstown. We have to get stakeholder involvement um, to close the winter gap. And that's where these rearing tunnels come in, as I said. And now we need to take this technology to the rest of the world. As I said, we just recently um, sent Megamelis to Zimbabwe and we're hoping to get it into Malawi and Tanzania um, and, um, and plenty more countries. So that's my story. Um, I hope it wasn't too much of a ramble. I, get, I can talk for hours on this. So if, they, if you have more questions, please um, yeah, let me know. And thank you to all to, to our 
to those who sponsor us. We get a lot of um, a lot of sponsorship from Environmental Affairs, from the National Research Foundation, from the Water Research Commission, and from Rhodes University. Julie, thank you very much. We're going to give you a moment to catch your breath. Uh, <laughs> we... I sped up at the end there when I realized. <laughs> Um, we would just like to thank you for a very, very informative session. Um, it's clear from the people joining from so many places um, all over Africa and beyond Africa that there is a need for knowledge on this topic. Um, so thank you for sharing your knowledge. Um, I think Marit might have mentioned to you that I recently met a student from uh, Rwanda who told me that he visited a community on Lake Kiwu where they had this problem with the water hyacinth and he shared the knowledge that he picked up on your video on Share Screen Africa with that's that community. That's amazing. That's absolutely so, yeah, amazing. That's what we that's what we love to hear. But also what I get from your um from your video from your presentation tonight, you know, there's we live in a crazy time when um people doubt science all the time. And it was just great for me to see tonight the value of scientific process that you can find solutions that can really turn around massive problems. So thank you thank very you. much. Thanks, thanks. And I didn't do this alone. This is a huge, um, this is a, a huge group of, of us who work on this. Um, yeah, it's a it's a big collaborative project and certainly not mine by myself. So let's step into the QA. Um, you're welcome to use the reaction tools at the bottom of the screen or you can wave at us um Maret will unmute you i see there are already a whole lot of questions in the um in the chat i'm going to just scroll up and start at the beginning um so asima i am going to ask you to unmute I am assuming because you asked a lot of your questions early on in the presentation that some of them might have been answered by now. So if you maybe want to, um, you know, I think Jan might have frozen. Um, it's happened before. So when he freezes like that, we <laughs> I need to take over. So let me um, let me ask the the question, or let's try and um, unmute Asima. Um, Asima is unmuted, Marty. Okay, thanks, uh, Maret. Asima, if you want to just ask your questions, please. Um. Good evening. I Hi. don't know. Am I on? Yes, we can. Yes, hear we you. can hear you. <laughs> okay. Okay. There's um load shedding just now, so if you see me, I'm. Um, offline just now um, yeah it has happened mm -hmm. uh, so basically what I was asking is um, you know when using the chemical defense like basically to control the water hyacinth does that not like um, impact the water quality or deteriorate it since you already know that you know the water quality in South Africa is bad so using the water quality wouldn't it make it like um, wouldn't it worsen the situation uh, um, it it does, and not only because of the actual chemical, but how it um, kills the the plant. Um, it is um, so the registered. There are a couple of registered herbicides. Um, we don't we don't um, necessarily promote herbicide use. Um, we 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 we're looking at different ways of integrating herbicides because of the the negative effects. Um, also because of the costs. Um, and also because it's not um, sustainable. So you can herbicide the plants, um, but every plant that is left behind will then regenerate as soon as you as soon as you stop praying. I mean spraying <laughs> and praying. So you really have to, um, if you're going to use chemicals, it has to be a continuous um, approach. And of course that that's very costly. Um, glyphosate, which is the main one used in South Africa, um, is it does dissociate into its salts in the water, um, and I'm, I'm I don't want to talk about chemicals because that's such a that becomes so very political. Um, you know, there's in the U.S. glyphosate um, has obviously been shown to cause cancer. It's banned in in the in Europe, um, and the fact that we're still using it on our water is probably a huge issue. But yeah, it's not it's not a it's not a good way. And then I see you asked chemical or mechanical again, mechanical removal. That plant grows so quickly, 
so much money, so many machines have been um, developed, so much aid has been sent throughout Africa, throughout um, Asia, for these harvesters, these mechanical harvesters that, that pull water hyacinth out. Um, but if the plants don't have any biocontrol agents on them, they're not slowing down, they're just growing. Water hyacinth can double every um, seven to 14 days. So as fast as they're being removed, they're just growing. So if you can't remove them as fast as they're growing, again, you just, you, you're wasting, um, well, spending a lot of time and energy doing it. So the, the, the use of biocontrol is the most sustainable um, and the most long-term. Okay, and then um, you know the algae bloom sometimes also is used basically to like um get rid of the water um hyacinth, right? Not so, that I know of. Okay, so what would happen? Let's just say, for example, uh, if the seedlings of the hyacinth perhaps maybe happen to survive, how would you like um that tell that up? How would you so you'd get more biocontrol agents onto them? This hyacinth seed does survive. And um, it does germinate as soon as it gets warm in spring. And that's when we need to make sure that the water hyacinth control agents are released onto them. So that um, it's almost, we're looking at like a mopping, a mopping effect. So how many seeds are regenerating each season? We don't know, you know, is it, is it the entire seed bank generating or is it just a portion of it? But what is so important, and that I didn't mention, is that the action of the biocontrol agents prevents the plants from flowering, whereas chemical control often promotes flowering. So what um, we're doing is, is not only um, mopping up those seeds in the seed bank, but we're also preventing any new seeds being um, reintroduced into the seed bank. And the last question I wanted to and out. Um, so basically, you say that the biological control has been used in South Africa. Um, have you all perhaps uh, tried to maybe move it um, anywhere else apart from South Africa? And has it been shown that it's successful or was the issues that were faced um, with it? Well, I think we have shown that it's that it can be successful. Um, we've got a number of aquatic weeds that biocontrol is 100% 100% successful on. Things like water lettuce, um, salvinia or cariba weed, azolla, um, cactus. It's it's and it's not only used in South Africa. It's across um, the U.S., Canada, Mexico, um, Australia, New Zealand, parts of Asia. Europe is still very um, wary of it, um, but but I think that's also that's also breaking down as they realize how beneficial biological control can be. Um, the safety is always a question that everybody asks. What happens if all the plants die? Um, then what are the insects going to eat? Well, the insects will die too, because the only thing that they can eat is the plant that they've been released against. They might, as, as you saw, those um, thousands of insects that um, were uh, that left the plant, they might land on a plant and be so thirsty or so hungry that they'll that they'll try to feed on it but they can't get anything from it because there's all kind plants have got horrible chemicals in them um and they'll they'll essentially be be poisoned or um, repelled and so there is no um known unanticipated negative effects of biological control okay and then are these insects um indigenous or you must have come in late because I said that the insects come from the place where the where the plant originated. So you have to go back to the area of where, where the plant is indigenous and you find the insects that are its natural enemies that it co-evolved with. And then we introduce them into the new range where it has invaded. Well, thanks, Asima, for all your questions. And um, the, Murphy's got his hand up, so I'm going to ask him to unmute and then uh, we'll let him ask his question. Um, thank you, um, Julie, for the wonderful presentation. It was quite thank informative. You. Yes, um, it was quite informative. Um, I just had one question. When you are rearing the, the insects in the lab, how do you keep the plants... Um, surviving during the winters because it seems like they have an annual cycle where they die off during winters so how yeah. do you do that um in the part, yeah. 
Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, we grow them in greenhouse tunnels. Um, we can get nice growth, but we obviously need optimal growth. And one of our um, partners, um, one of our rearing stations at the coves at Harder Beer Sport said, well, why don't we put fish tank heaters into the water? And so these little fish tank heaters that cost about two or 300 rand, we can pop them, you know, as long as there's electricity, pop them into these um, cubic, meet, what's it, a cubic meter of, of water, it heats it up and then not only does it heat that water up, but it heats the entire tunnel up. So we've got this real nice little hot house, the plants grow, the insects are happy. And we, at the moment, we're actually dealing with too many insects at a number of our rearing stations where people are saying, we're running out of water hyacinth because these insects are just going crazy and there's no water hyacinth to release them on. So we have to say, well, collect the insects, either kill them or find somewhere um, maybe in you know close by that you can release them onto um so it really becomes a a um, thing of keeping the plants healthy keeping the insects healthy but not too healthy um so <laughs> that that's what we we're learning um about at the moment and everyone's learning from each other we've got a whatsapp group and uh, you know everyone's like oh, okay um i found that if i sink the plants with a with a metal grid i can then collect all the insects that float to the surface with a little sieve and then kill them or release them somewhere on the dam where maybe there's there's a few plants um, and then that kind of information gets spread around um, the various um, rearing stations so it really is a collaborative effort okay thank you thank you for that thank you thanks Mary, for your question um if there's no other hands up um if you've uh, <clears throat> i'm going to just read some of the questions that are in the chat um so from carl Pana, she, uh, she or he, I'm not too sure, is asking um, biological agents may affect other crops also. But they don't. Yeah, no, no. no. So they, 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 they yeah. were just asking um, th yeah. that question. Um, yeah, so they don't. Just, just on that, I'll quickly answer. Um, there was a case of um, the Neocatina weevils in Lake Victoria moved off on, you know, in their hundreds because there was no water hyacinth left for them and they went off to look for more water hyacinth um, and they ended up in a banana plantation and the weevils made a few scars on the banana leaves and there was a huge outcry saying that um, the biocontrol agents have switched host and they're feeding on the, the, the banana leaves. Um, um, a, a huge inspection was done, an evaluation was done and it was, they were, desperate and just looking doing some exploratory feeding um after one bite they died and and that was the end of that so there are no um there's no reports of biocontrol agents establishing and affecting um crops perfect thanks then the second half of kalpana's question was when water science is um is impacted by biological agents how is it removed from the water body so we saw all those dead brown um plants floating um do they literally just disintegrate by degrade or um, what, what yeah. if you can maybe elaborate yeah. a bit on that so yes exactly they um they get waterlogged um from the tunneling and the leaves start to die and they they sink to the bottom so that's become an issue lately where people are saying well they're putting nutrients back into the system so wouldn't it be better to remove them if you're dealing with a small system, absolutely remove remove the plants. Uh, looking at Hardebeersport Dam, a study was done looking at how 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 much um, how much phosphates, how many phosphates entered the system, and what water hyacinth could take up. Because often people say, "Well, water hyacinth will clean the water," and what water hyacinth can take up is zero point one percent of what's coming in and that is at full mm. cover so it it, it's a really good take up of nutrients but there's so many coming in that it's not making any difference at all so when people are now worried about the plants decomposing and falling to the bottom and adding but they're not adding they're they're taking up what's already in the water and when they die it's 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 a closed it's a closed system mm. oh, thanks um uh, the there's an, the same sort of question was asked um, by Ikhopaleng, so I'm not going to read that one. Um, 
Kusala has asked what happens to the waste from the decay that might settle down in the lake bed. I think it's the same sort of thing, um, but yeah. does it in essence become like the silt and the, the sand? Is it not going to cause a problem from actually silting up the whole um, dam it, water body? It does, but so, so again, this hasn't been um, properly investigated. We don't actually know um, how much it's contributing, and it's a study that I want to look at because the amount of sediment coming from upstream coming from Johannesburg coming from Pretoria or whatever system you on um contributes to the siltation of a of a dam no matter you know no matter where you are so is that silt siltation does it outweigh the decomposition of water hyacinth I don't know and then the sort of second part of the question is do they end up generating methane as they're decomposing and whatever because obviously if that's the, a bad, bad for the environment. Yes, exactly. So if the plants are sprayed with a herbicide and that whole mat, it's, it, it dies quickly and it sinks quickly. And then you get rapid, uh, well, you get decomposition and you get rapid release of methane gases. Biocontrol is much slower. So you don't get this sudden sinking and the sudden um, decomposition. It's gradual. And so we don't get that um, build up that would happen with, with a chemical application. No, perfect. Thanks for that. Um, again, if anybody wants to ask their own question live, just go to the bottom of the reaction tools and raise your hand and we'll look out for you. But I'm going to carry on reading uh, questions from the chat in the meantime. Um, so I think you have answered it, but maybe you can just elaborate in a bit more detail. How bad does the water hyacinth thing affect the living organisms in the water? Um, so, I mean, does it literally kill all of those small bugs and insects, or are there still some in minor numbers, and are they returning, you know, in those uh, seasons where um, the water hyacinth sort of dies out, do they actually get a chance to, to come back, or is the water in such a poor quality that they also don't survive? Um, I, so, you know, Hardebiosport is such an impacted system, but in other systems, so like the... Um, that, that system where I, we actually did the study looking at the macroinvertebrates, where there is water hyacinth, all you get are invasive snails. The majority of things are invasive snails and um, bloodworms, which are these chironomids that can live in, in very polluted environments. As soon as you go um, in, a, in a nearby area in the same system that has no water hyacinth, there's an abundance of, of aquatic biodiversity. So what water hyacinth does is it blocks the light. If there's no light penetrating, there's no photosynthesis. If there's no photosynthesis, there's no oxygen production. And so that whole water column becomes um, anaerobic. And because of that, any aerobic organisms can't, can't survive and only the most um, tolerant of toxic um, conditions. And water bodies, are they, they, they can be quite resilient. And so as soon as you start you know as soon as it starts to recover you do get this recolonization of of aquatic insects because most of their most aquatic invertebrates are um, larvae and the adults are things like dragonflies um mayflies and they fly around and they find suitable places to um to um live to recolonize so yes move as soon as you start removing this this huge pest you, you get um, a recovery. So Bill Rittmiller asked a question. Um, there is actually an interest or uh, made, made a statement and maybe you can add to this. There's an interesting economic use for water hyacinth elsewhere, cane furniture, which has been in, uh, maybe environmentally friendly. Just uh, have you come across that at all? Absolutely. There's so much water hyacinth. Let's use it um, to make stuff. Um, there's lots of cottage industries um, all over Africa, all over Asia. I'm looking at how we can um, use this, this abundance of, of raw material. It can never be, it should never be seen as a control option because um, the amount that's removed is always replaced because of what, uh, water hyacinths. Um, massive regenerative um, properties. And um, we don't promote it in South Africa because it could create a conflict. You know, what, what we did have um, at Harder Beersport Dam was a, before the implementation of the Mega Mellis program, was a fertilizer company or a compost company. And they were allowed to, they were given permission by environmental affairs to harvest water hyacinth and make compost. And they had a thriving little business growing, but they weren't controlling the plant. 
they were making money off it, which was great. You know, I don't, they, they, they shouldn't be a reason not to make money off something like that. And they, they were employing 30 women, which was, which was great. But as soon as the biocontrol agents destroyed water hyacinth, that whole production had to stop. And so we don't want that conflict of, um, of creating a requirement for the world's worst weed. I 100% understand that. Thanks. Um, you had mentioned the Zambezi population, um, uh, sorry, the Zambezi potentially has a, a hyacinth inundation. Could this be as a result uh, in, in any threat to the Okavango Delta? Um, so yes, the Zambezi does have water hyacinth, Lake Kariba has water hyacinth. Um, it doesn't back, it can't backflow into the Delta. And Botswana is so, um, they've got such an excellent um, early warning um, system and monitoring system that they are absolutely um, on the ball, keeping, keeping an eye for water hyacinth entering Botswana's borders. About 10 years ago, um, it, it was on the border um, with South Africa from the Crocodile River. Um, and, and there was an intervention, as I said the other day about um, on June the 16th, actually, I saw a, um, we did a helicopter um, survey and there was water hyacinth on the Limpopo. You know, where that could get to the Okavango, um, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a, it's, it would be quite a trip for a water hyacinth plant, but it's, you know, it's never, it's not impossible, but they do have an excellent monitoring um, system. But, but I think the point you also made was, with the um, phosphate levels at such massive and high levels in South Africa, that's what's actually sustaining it. If the exactly. phosphate levels, if the phosphate levels were at normal or controlled levels, the hyacinth wouldn't be the problem that it is. It, it, the hyacinth is a symptom of water pollution. If we can clean mm. up our water, I won't have a job, but at least there won't be any water hyacinth. <laughs> cool. Um, I was just uh, the next question. I'm I'm just going through. There's a couple that have asked um, uh -huh. questions. Um, is there any website would you suggest that publishes water quality for dams in South Africa? Does it? Do, Where's that? Um, sorry, can you in, just in, repeat it? Sorry, uh, it's a question from Laurent um, Msika. Any website would you suggest that publishes water quality for dams in South Africa? Um, yes, so GWS does have um, the National Water Quality Monitoring. Um, I think it's, I, I think they're trying to get it up and running again. I know that for a couple of years um, and a lot of the um, dams, the water quality monitoring um, hasn't hasn't happened. I know how to be sport, there's no water quality monitoring, which is absolutely insane, given it's our most polluted um, system. Um, I think water and sanitation keeps trying to outsource it um, and it just it, it, it doesn't happen. But if you if you look, if you do go onto um, the DWS website and look up the natural national eutrophication management strategy, or just Google that, you should be able to find um, a water quality um, information. And DWS is the Department of Water Services, maybe? Water and Sanitation. So it's the National <laughs> Department of Water and Sanitation. Cool, thanks for that. Um, and then uh, I think your comment about the rowing and rotor plot dam is probably what sparked the second half of the questions. What are the risks for human health in South African dams? <laughs> I wouldn't say that the water, well, water hyacinth is a risk. Um, people got stranded in a boat, in a big boat at, at Harder Beersport Dam. Um, canoeists get stuck in it and rowers get stuck in it. But the real problem is, is the diseases in the water. So Rudiplot Dam, the E. coli levels are, are order of magnitude through the roof. They, you know, I think you're allowed to anything below. Oof, I don't want to say numbers, but I think it's anything below 100 is okay and when they measured it the other day it was like four thousand or something um so you're just looking at, you know you're going to get dysentery you're going to get well there's cholera in some of our systems so yeah human health and south african water is a big issue at the moment okay um leticia otomo asked did you also look at other plants that could possibly control what is the hyacinth or is it only the the insects um, we haven't looked at plants because I'm not entirely sure how a plant would control 
another plant other than than competition. Um, any native plant is a um, inferior competitor um, because it has its own suite of natural enemies. So water hyacinth just says, "Sorry, I'm I'm taking all the nutrients and all the space and um, nothing for you." Um, I know. I think a lot of work's been done um, in in India and in um, in some parts of Europe and even in other countries in Africa, looking at plant extra extracts as poisons for water hyacinth. Um, but again, you know, they were they wouldn't be specific to water hyacinth, whereas the insects are specific. They can only feed on water hyacinth, whereas a, whereas a toxic plant exudate would probably kill all kinds of plants. Okay, and then just a question for myself. There's a few others, but um, once once you've got all the water hyacinth under control, what is the next water plant that needs to be um, sorted? The blue green algae or, or all of those? I mean, have you got any sort of good good plans for any of the other ones that are, are challenging us? So I saw my student Tracia Chikodza was in here. She's so she's looking at what's happening at Harder Beersport at the moment, and it's exactly that we're controlling water hyacinth. But because we haven't controlled the driver, we have another invasive there called Salvinia minima. Um, we do have a control agent that we've asked for permission to release it. We're just waiting to hear if we have permission. Um, but when water hyacinth disappears, Salvinia minima just explodes, and that's because water hyacinth is a superior competitor. Um, and when it disappears, Salvinia minima says, okay, cool, here, here I go. What we have found in a lot of our other systems um, is that when water hyacinth disappears, we get a regime shift. So a shift from this floating plant dominance to submerged plant dominance. And we have quite a lot of invasive um, submerged plants, things like Brazilian waterweed, um, there's hydrilla in Pongola, there's um, water hornwort, and as soon as we get this top layer disappearing, suddenly you've got light and nutrients accessible, and so the bottom stuff comes up and takes over. And we do have a control program for Brazilian waterweed, but that's the only one at the moment. Um, there's just a question here, is water hyacinth poisonous? I think you have said no, um, because it's being yeah. used in other things. Um, in the in the fertilizer, are the seeds um, an issue if it is turned into fertilizer that potentially the, the seeds could spread as well? Or, I mean, are yes. there any rules in terms of... Um, yeah, there is. So if it's, if it's made into compost, it has to be heat treated beyond a certain um, temperature. I don't know how how well regulated that is. Um, just with that, is water hyacinth poisonous? Not in itself, but because it can take up so much stuff out of the water, um, it takes up heavy metals, it takes up all kinds of toxins. And so by virtue of its really good um, um, concentrating of capabilities, it can become toxic. So when it is fed, you know, it is fed in, in, in areas to livestock um, for fodder, it can actually bioaccumulate um, things like heavy metals. Okay, thanks. That's very interesting. Um, I think most of the other comments, um, there's one, one from Ben Araseb. Hi, Julie. You mentioned water source becoming anaerobic. So how does the, this affect other aerobic organisms and how does this relate to eutrophication of the water source? I think you have covered it. I don't know, maybe if you want to um, yeah. explain a little bit more detail. Yeah, I think I think I have covered it. Um, it's not so much the the water source. Well, water source we think is the the water coming into the system, but if it's the actual system where the water hyacinth is becoming anaerobic, it obviously kills anything. Um, there are a lot of fish like bass and carp that can actually tolerate these levels, which is why we do get um them quite dominant in invaded systems, but um. How does it affect other aerobic organisms and how does it relate to eutrophication? It's all this cycle, water hyacinth, because of eutrophication, um, yeah, and it, all its impacts that it has. Then I don't see any more questions. Um, I, I just got a couple more myself, if that's okay. Um, in terms of the actual seed bed, is there any way of, besides dredging or anything and of course that's massively expensive so it will never be done so it's just a you know for the next how many years do you think we're going to be dealing this 
um, cycle of um, something in a way that's almost unsustainable because of the, yeah. um, the, the, the contamination in the water. Yeah, I, I don't know. We actually, we, we are doing soil cores so we can see um, if, if the seed bank is the same from year to year or um, is it actually depleting? And have they looked at any maybe bugs or swimming insects or any fish that might eat the seeds from um, from the South American no, area? No, no, nothing like that. Is it? Is it a they're tiny so tiny, stream? you know, yeah. they're so tiny, and they're just part of the they're part of the soil particles, really. I think, Marty, um, let's if there are no further questions, let's let's thank Julie, and um, we end the evening here. I think it's been an overload of information, of really valuable information. more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed um, yeah, chatting. The, the, the chatting at the end is always the fun bit. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks very much, Julie, and for answering all those questions. And I'm sure everybody learned a, a lot. And it's not as simple as, um, as, as people think. Um, and I think uh, we've good. seen a lot of people have wasted millions and millions and millions. So I think... Your solution or your team's solution, let me put it that way, um, has really been a, a, a great a great thing. And let's hope it's um, in time can eradicate this horrendous weed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good job. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Marty. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your participation. Yeah,